Hi, I'm Deborah Collier, President of Patient Advocates and Research, otherwise known as PEAR. And I'm being joined by uh, Jan Nissen. And Jan is the Vice President of Patient Innovation at Merck and Company, Inc. And we are here today to talk about the DIA 2018 Global Annual Meeting. We're here, here in Boston. And uh, Jan put together a diverse group of industry, patient, and regulator stakeholders. Uh, and you also spoke at a diamond session here at DIA earlier uh, in the morning. And, and I believe the title was Global Perspectives on Patient Engagement. That's correct, right? yes. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So p thank you for joining yes, me. Yes, of course. And welcome. Uh, looking forward to talking with you about that session and, and the various points that came up and things that people can take home and hopefully start using in their yes. own areas. So before we start, I guess uh, we'll provide the audience with a brief overview of the session. And the session included uh, in information uh, about global patient engagement. In Europe and North America, patient engagement in drug development is now expected, in most cases anyway, mm -hmm. um, although it is not perfect. There is still a long way to go for that. And in this session that we're talking about today, um, you and your fellow panelists discussed what was happening in other parts of the world, right, globally, um, for patient engagement uh, other than North America and Europe and what's been initiated, what initiatives there are in three different regions primarily. Um, and that it would include uh, Asia as well as Latin America and uh, then uh, maybe a few other places as well, correct? That's right, that's okay. right. Great, so that's could you maybe in a, just a few words kind of give us an idea of what you feel the main message was from the session? Yes, I think it was a really interesting session. Uh, because what I think it showed and the main message that I took away was that the states of pac patient engagement is that they're in various states around the world, right? right? Um, and in some cases, Europe and the U.S. may be being a little bit further advanced in terms of the extent to which patient engagement um, is, is being utilized and is being recognized by regulators and maybe um, in a different place of evolution, maybe in Asia and Latin America. But it seems that it's really changing um, it, when you see that even in Japan, the PFMD, in fact, is now beginning to bring in patient perspectives in Japan, okay. for example. So I think reg regulators are beginning to help shape the importance of patient engagement um, and uh, similar to what would have happened in the US and in Europe. So it's great to see that. Good. And I think uh, we also found out in parts of Asia and also Latin America, some of the regulatory agencies or government agencies are also trying to help um, prepare patient advocates or patient representatives for this role. Isn't that right? Yes, they are. And um, that's really, really important that the patient understands to tell their story Right, but then to also talk about the larger role, right, right. Of, of being able to talk about the groups of patients that this would help and that the access and reimbursement to the medications to help this large group of patients is so important. Okay. Um, and I think we're also seeing that there are um, advocacy groups from other countries and other parts of the world that have capabilities, right, that are a little bit more advanced that are now coming to other parts of the world and other right. countries, right, to help them set up and understand how you build an advocacy organization. Right, in fact, um, some of the pair members have been doing that oh, as well. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, Terrific. so that's fun. Um, so I wonder if there were any points that you felt were important to bring out of things that might be hampering efforts, and then we can talk about things that may be promoting efforts as well. Right, so, so hampering efforts, I would say that for industry, and I, I guess I represent industry, um, industry has been pretty much focused on the learned intermediary, the HCP, right? And so it's a fairly new development, if you will, to, um, to take processes and operating models around the patient. And so I think we're a little bit early in our evolution of, of including the patient to the degree that we need to. 
Um, and so I think our researchers need to understand the importance of bringing in the patient perspective. And so that's still, I would say, evolving, quite honestly. So I think that's one that's sort of hampering. But I think in terms of the areas and opportunities that are helping engagement, um, certainly we talked about the regulators already, but um, if you look at other healthcare institutions, right, um, they are really very focused on patient engagement, patient experience, right? right. Uh, so that I think, um, in a sense, we're all kind of working together to create the era of the patient. Okay. okay. <laughs> it, there seem to be a lot of things that need to change within the industry, and of course we don't have time to talk about all of those, yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as, but it's a mindset change mm -hmm. too, wouldn't you say? Yes. Um, because even if we use terms like patient-centric or patient engagement, we have to actually change the way business has been done in the past to really make that real. So um, I don't know if there were any things that came out in the session, in the discussion period, uh, mm -hmm. in those types of areas. Well, one of the big areas of discussion in the session was the fact that the patient-provider relationship has to evolve. Right. And in many, it, it seemed universal around the world that it's still a very deferential um, position and, and relationship, if you will, um, where the, the provider thinks they understand what the patient needs and, and very often is not taking the time to understand. We talked a lot about um, the evolution of medical school curriculum yes. that really needs to um, involve a greater empathy and understanding of the patient, the caregiver, to really understand the patient's whole environment that impacts their health care. Right. Along with communication skills, right. because there's such a short period of time in a very crisis kind of situation that people have to deal with illness or medical conditions uh, and being able to understand that but also communicate mm -hmm. clearly and well and empathetically is something that I think could be additional training that doctors and medical providers could get. Uh, and, and I think that there's a role that we could play together mm -hmm. in helping create that type of material with companies, patient groups, and providers as well. Absolutely. So. And then always including the sort of health literacy, you know, the importance yes. of that. I can remember hearing a statistic that suggested, I guess, a study that had been done with patients when first diagnosed with lung cancer that their literacy level, right, you know, gets down to about a second grade level because right. of the impact of that um, message just being given to them. So certainly understanding the importance, as you said, of communication, speaking at the right literacy level, terminology, um, and also an understanding of the right times to communicate. Okay, okay. Um, yes, and it seems that, you know, at that time, it doesn't matter how many degrees you have at the end of your name either. Your body's putting you physiologically through shock, and it's very difficult to comprehend what's going on at the time. Exactly. So there are, and there are, uh, there is research and evidence out there about what to do for communication skills and mm -hmm. on all of those types yes. of things. Okay. Well, would you say that um, there are any regions that are closer to implementing uh, patient engagement activities or? So um, in Europe, um, the European Medicines Association, the regulator there, um, has really been incorporating patient input in their drug development right. you know, all along the way. Whereas in the US, um, the patient-focused drug development uh, is really just kind of underway now. In fact, just last week we received the first guidance um, right. uh, about that. Um, and so I'd say that those two areas of the world are probably a little bit ahead. And then some of the regulators coming on board, we talked at the, at the meeting yesterday about Korea and Japan and how those regulators are beginning to bring in patient input okay. as well. So um, I think it, it seems to all be converging around everyone seeing the importance of the patient in the R&D process. Right, right. And I know FDA has had different programs at different times starting like from 1990 or maybe even in the 80s for AIDS, but you're right, it hasn't been a full initiative until more recently. And it, there is an opportunity, at least through part of July, I'm not exactly sure what the date is, for everyone to get public comments into the uh, draft guidance that is out there. So that would be a really important thing to do Absolutely. at this point. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us, Jan? 
Yeah, so I, I think the other area that might require some additional um, I would say research is that when we talk about patient engagement, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, um, it is all about behavior change, Absolutely. right? And so um, how do we as uh, an industry and a group of stakeholders working with patients and advocacy groups begin to really understand the behavioral science behind engagement? Right. And um, I also think that from our company's perspective that if we were able to understand the science behind behavior change, mm -hmm that um, that would be a very good complement to the science we put into the clinical aspects of our products. Great. Yes, as well as the science and evidence that's there on health literacy and communication yes. skills and all of those types of things. Um, and I think one of the things that could be very important as well, uh, the behavioral science certainly within organizations, there's organizational development behaviors as yes. well that, <laughs> good point. that need to be, you know, mirrored and you know from leadership on down yes so, yeah great point yeah that's a great point yeah great well thank, thank you, you very much yeah. thank you it's very great much. to meet you it was so nice talking to you today nice to talk with you too thank you thanks